Powerpuff Girls, Blossom Bubbles and Buttercup. Powerpuff Girls Sea Watches. The Powerpuff Time is three. If you've been following my channel for the past few weeks, then you know that we've talked endlessly about the amount of Powerpuff Girls media that we've been flooded with over the years. They've been adapted in almost every medium known to man. From cartoons and video games to comics, music, movies to reboots, you name it, we've gotten it. The Powerpuff Girls have been relevant in all forms of media. Well, for the most part at least. Which makes me wonder how something like a Powerpuff Girls anime series could go by so unnoticed. With the Powerpuff Girls being as extremely popular as they are, and the rise in anime popularity, you'd think it'd be an immediate hit, right? I mean, it was produced by Cartoon Network, who just happened to own the most popular anime block in the United States. So what exactly went wrong? Was the problem the anime itself or a lack of confidence from the studios? Come with me as we explore the strange origin of Powerpuff Girls Z. When reviewing an adaptation, I prefer to judge it on its own merits, so to do so we need to get rid of the differences between the two shows already. When making an adaptation of something, the creator of the adaptation is left with two choices. They can either create something familiar but unique that can have the chance to stand on its own and not be directly compared to what came before, or they can just rehash what's already there and stay as close to the source material as possible. The problem with option one is that if the show doesn't feel enough like what people are used to, then it's going to be hard to get people to actually stay and watch. But the bigger problem present in option two is that if you're redoing what's already been done, the fans already know what to expect, and the fan base that does like it, sure, they'll stick around, but how are you expected to grow anywhere? That, and you'll have to live with the fact that your adaptation will never be the thing that it's trying to imitate. It'll always just be an imitation. Lucky for us, Powerpuff Girls Z takes the first approach, because almost nothing is the same here. I mean, sure, you got all the characters that you know, love, and care for, but none of them besides the girls are like the respective counterparts. You've got the professor who's been stripped of everything that's made him, you know, him. And he now has a son and a robot dog for some reason. Mojo Jojo is now a full body cape wearing monkey man who is actually still pretty hilarious. I'm not going to lie. Silly human. Wait, stop. No, I have you. Ah! And then there's the mayor who just kind of exists, I guess. He's a take him or leave him type deal, nothing special, he's pretty much just a Monopoly guy now. And by his side like always, Miss Sarah Bella, who is exactly like she was in the original, except for the fact that they for some reason made her blonde. Outside of that obviously poor design choice, she's exactly like she was. Her face is always covered up in some really clever way, you know the deal. This is not a banger. This but is this is where the choices that I brought up earlier would actually come into play. I know I said nothing was the same before, and that still kind of stands, but the things they do decide to change are pretty interesting. They didn't stray too far off the path of the original show, while also doing things that can make their version stand out among the original. One of the things that they did change was the origin, which is pretty out there, I'm not gonna lie, it's, it's pretty out there. You see, Unlike the original show, these girls are not products of the professor. They aren't even real sisters, they're just three girls who happen to go to the same junior high. The only thing they knew about each other before getting their powers was their reputation that they had in school. Bubbles being the most popular girl in school, every boy had a crush on her and she's far too naive to even know that anybody has a crush on her. Buttercup is the captain of every sports team at the school, and Bubbles believes her to be the most athletic person in the world, and she even says she looks up to her because of it. While Blossom, on the other hand, is described to be a superhero geek who obsesses over comic books and cartoons, they gave the girls a little bit more depth as opposed to giving them each just one trait. That could have been really easy for them to do, yet they stayed away from that, so I'm thankful for that. Well, anyways, their origin goes as such. One day, the professor was working with his son in an experiment. When their robot dog... Did, did I mention they had a robot dog? Anyways, their robot dog accidentally dropped a sweet roll into the chemicals. The chemicals in question were a serum the professor was making called Chemical Z. So no Chemical X? I guess we're just renaming it for no reason? 
I mean, the only time I can remember this being done is when Blistina from the reboot was created with Chemical W. Which is interesting, and kinda puzzles me. I just can't think of a reason for why they want to change it, but my theory is that calling it Chemical Z would give them an excuse to put Z at the end of the title, and they were really hoping that some Dragon Ball Z fans would jump on board. Uh, I guess that's my theory. I'm not sure though. Well, it's no longer Chemical X, it's something new. Yes, Chemical Z! Chemical Z confirmed. But anyways, the role causes a reaction that seems to perfect the serum. So this is where the professor officially changes the name of it from X to Z. Why? I still don't know why. But with the serum now perfected along with having a new name, the world's climate completely starts to change for some reason. For some strange reason that I don't really remember and I'm too lazy to research, the world's weather flipped on its head and Townsville was now covered in snow and icebergs. While the other parts of the world that are usually cold are now extremely hot and desert-like. So Ken, the professor's kid, has an idea to use Chemical Z that they just created to somehow change the weather back to normal. Which has very little to do with what Chemical Z was meant for in the first place, so I really don't understand why he thought that would work. But lucky for Ken, there seems to be a perfectly placed laser gun right in the middle of the room that just so happens to be able to concentrate the chemicals and turn it into a beam. And despite the professor pleading Ken not to shoot an untested chemical gun out into the city, he decides to do it anyway. Which blows up an iceberg in the middle of the city, but in the smoke and the breeze a bunch of light rays shot out in different directions all over New Townsville. Anyways, we now see Blossom who is eating her lunch alone and notices that a beam was headed straight towards a little girl. So Blossom drops her lunch and leaps into the direction of the girl causing her to take the full force of the blast. Miyako, which is Bubbles' real name in this series, leaves the mall and sees a young girl blowing bubbles which reminds her of her childhood. She then sees a beam headed towards the little girl and decides to shield her from the blast as well. Then on the other side of town, while skateboarding home from school, Buttercup happens to see the exact same thing. A ray of light headed towards the little boy and she does the same thing the others did and protects the child. And for some reason one of the beams also shot out and hit the professor's robot dog? The professor acts really impressed by this and I know it's anime logic and I shouldn't be looking that deep into it but it's a robot dog. Why didn't the professor just program it to speak in the first place if it wanted it to speak? I'm I'm confused. Why would a beam of light from the sky make a robot dog speak fluent English? You know what? It doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter. It's fine. Anime logic, that's okay. We have fun with it. Sure. Oh, wow, wow, wow. Oh, no. It was bow, wow, wow, wow. But when the light beams shot out from the debris, there were both light and dark beams. Each of the girls had been hit with the light beam, but a random monkey at the Townsville Zoo wasn't so lucky. Because that dark beam would birth Mojo Jojo. Mojo Jojo then decides with his newfound freedom that it was time to free all of the animals at the zoo who he believed to be held in captivity. Which to be fair, I mean they have. It's a, it's a zoo. And now Blossom who notices the commotion is surrounded by zoo animals and has built up the courage to try and stop whoever is responsible for this. But before she can do that, let's review really quick. The girls have been shot with the light beam that has seemed to give them new outfits, superhuman abilities, and weapons to use in battles. What weapons? I don't remember any weapons you say. Well, Bubbles was given a wand staff that can blow bubbles, capture people with them, and even deflect missiles. I know you're wondering now. Okay, so it seems like the weapons are based off of their names? Well, not exactly because Buttercup was given a huge over-the-shoulder mallet which doesn't really have anything to do with her name, but it makes sense with her character, considering she's the aggressive one. I mean, it's better than her throwing actual buttercups at enemies, I guess. But that leaves Blossom. What weapon did she get? Can you guess it? Correct! Of course it's a yo-yo! Because when I think of Blossom, I sure do think of yo-yos. Seriously, Bubbles got a magical wand capable of deflecting missiles, Buttercup has an oversized hammer, and they couldn't think of anything better to arm this poor little girl with than a yo-yo? I might be talking a little trash, but when it isn't completely useless, it seems to get her out of harm's way. 
She then defeats Mojo and sends all the animals back into their cages. And after all of that, the professor, along with the mayor, tie her up to a bed and try to experiment on her. But they end up seeing Bubble skipping by. So they do what any adult with a van would do and try to capture her like she's a rare Pokemon. But Bubbles is just too blissful and naive to even notice. I mean, Mojo even confronts her and tried to attack her, but Bubbles literally just Mario bounces on his head and act like she doesn't even notice him. I mean, as if the poor guy hasn't been through enough already. I mean, they were lucky enough to get hit with the light beams and not the dark ones. Mojo was just a monkey. He never really had any say in this in the first place. He's a victim of circumstance and careless scientist. And the worst thing he's done up to until this point was free a couple zoo animals. Yet all Blossom wants to do is kick this man's keister. But if you don't think things have gotten confusing enough just yet, the Powerpuff Girls end up going back to the lab so the professor can run more tests on them. And follow me here, follow me here. So the professor runs his test and figures out that the only way the girls can activate their powers is by the belt radars that they have. Radars that can only be activated by the phrase Powerpuff Girls, a phrase that can only be said by the robot dog, who can scream it from anywhere in the city to alert them at any time they need them. See how I'm confused? I mean, it's, it's very convoluted, but I, I think it's cute if not stereotypical. So the professor and the mayor have absolutely no problem with letting these three girls who already have pre-established lives fight evil villains as long as their precious new Townsville is safe. Now, I know the original had somewhat of the same premise, but in that one the girls were born into being crime fighters. In this one the girls existed before Chemical X or Z if you will. They have parents and siblings in school, yet the mayor of all people is perfectly fine with pushing them into danger and then not even paying them for it. Capitalism, am I right? Uh, I don't know. I don't know if I'm right. I don't know what that. I don't even know what that means. But it all just seems so irresponsible. Yet I find myself enjoying the chaos of it all. But I can get past all of that because the show needs an excuse to let them do what they do, and I think they actually did a pretty good job at it. But the one thing that seriously holds it back for me is the relationship that they have with the professor. Them not being born by Chemical X, I can take. The mayor putting them in danger, I can take. I could even take them not being siblings. But the one thing that really bothers me is that they have no relationship with the professor. What? Boogeyman? What's going on in here? <laughs> Buttercup? Are you teasing your sisters again? Yes. Now I, I know we all have our reasons for loving the original, but it's such a simple show, it's such a simplistic premise that I start to wonder what makes it feel so warm. Then it dawned on me. A lonely professor accidentally creating three daughters? Three daughters who just happen to have superpowers, but even though they're nearly invincible, the professor still worries and cares about them as if they're his own flesh and blood? And even though they have powers and someone has to save the city, the professor would always be there for them to make sure they were prepared to do so. Not because he wanted research like this new guy, but because he wants to make sure that no matter what or who they go out there to face, they would always return home and do so safe because they're his daughters and he loves them. Taking that away from their relationship just makes it feel hollow and void of purpose. It's hard to care about them when the girls only exist to be their experiment. Uh, it, it was you! All this time it was you! And while I actually like this show and I find it cute in the having a background type way, I feel like the biggest mistake this show made was removing the family aspect and replacing it with genericness. Taking the professor as a father figure and the girls being siblings away was just too much to handle. And it's that type of thing that leads to a show feeling soulless and uninteresting. And I say that as someone who actually really enjoys this show. It's a really fun casual watch. But if there's any reason I can think of why it didn't take off, it would definitely be that.
The show would only ever end up airing overseas, and Cartoon Network didn't think that it would be a success in America despite the fact that they owned the Toonami block, which I think this would have been perfect for. But 2007 came, almost a year after it originally aired, the show would come to an end. Ending its run with a total of 50 episodes, which is actually pretty impressive, and I'm glad it got to exist in the first place. It makes me really happy when networks take a chance, and this one was a big risk. That didn't necessarily pay off, but I appreciate its existence. This show will forever live on as a piece of Powerpuff Girls history that the many fans, old and new, will someday discover, and hopefully, they'll be able to take something away from it as well. But as this video comes to a close, the sun sets on this Powerpuff Girls incarnation, and it soon rises on another.